Hi, hello, welcome back. Remember me? This is my YouTube channel where I post a video very infrequently. I wanted to do every month and lately it's more like every two to three months, but you know, well, I'll take what we can get. Am I right? So I just spent a long time. Ugh. You can probably hear the traffic outside and I even closed my window. I, I wish I couldn't have my window open. I love to have the fresh air and the cool air, but it was, it's too noisy and it's probably still a bit noisy with the window closed. So deal with it. Anyway, um, I spent kind of a long time framing this video. I actually think it could still be a little straighter. <laughs> I'm not starting over. Deal with it. Oh my God, that is my catchphrase of the day. Deal with it. Um, Anyway, I spent quite a while framing this video. I'm in a different angle, different spot of this room. You can see all of my belongings hung up on hooks on the wall behind me, which is not the prettiest background, but it's real, okay? This is my room where I live and I sleep and I work. And it's a small room, so we gotta make use of all the hooks and knobs and closets and whatever that I have access to. Here's something I haven't had in a while, some fresh flowers. When I first started this YouTube channel, I always had fresh flowers in my vids and I'd like to start going back to that, but I can't even take credit. These are not, I didn't get these intentionally for today's video. Um, my friend's aunt went to the market yesterday and brought lilies back for everyone in the house, which was sweet. Um, they're not quite open yet. This one's opening. Um, I have a little Yankee candle in the scent, <laughs> soft blanket, saying that reminded me of like saying in the colorway, in the scent, soft blanket. I got it from the mall where there is a Yankee candle kiosk. Um, yeah, probably it's poisoning me. I always hear that like candles and fragrances are like probably toxic, but oh well, everything's killing us. Uh, lately, I have been starting to record TikToks again. At least I was. Like, I don't think I've done one now for like a week because I just had such a busy week. But I used to be really into TikTok. I, then I didn't post for almost at all for a couple of years. And recently I posted a few TikToks. If you're, if you like TikTok, which I'm, I love TikTok. I'm on it every day. I don't post on it often, but if you're into TikTok, feel free to check out my profile. It's mostly like knitting stuff. And it's just James and Watts is my profile. What I wanted to say about recording TikToks is that as I was setting up the framing for today's YouTube video, I was about to sit down and start recording in like portrait mode without thinking and thank God I realized like, oh, I need to flip the phone sideways because this is going on YouTube. I mean, you can upload a video film the other way onto YouTube, but would not, not be good. It would, it would be like that with big black bars. So, uh, what's first? It's been such a long time since I've done this. I, I don't remember if it was January or February, maybe like end of January into beginning of February that I went to Budapest, Hungary, which was my first time there. I have wanted to go to Budapest ever since I moved to Croatia, just because uh, it's really cool seeming and it's really nearby. It's like a four hour, four or five hour drive from Zagreb. So finally I decided to just um, make it a solo trip and take a bus ride there. It was super easy. Um, I stayed in an Airbnb, which I had a whole 
decently spacious apartment to myself and the Airbnb cost less than, definitely less than $30 a night, maybe even closer to $20 a night. And there were tons of Airbnbs in Budapest for around $20 to $30 per night. So this trip actually was really on the inexpensive side. I typically, when I am traveling for, you know, like I was there for a full week, um, and if I'm in a city that's a bit more expensive, I get really fatigued of like having to find places to eat out for every meal and like go to restaurants multiple times a day. Just like the whole process of that can get tiring for me and it's expensive. So usually if I'm staying at an Airbnb with a kitchen, I make a point of going to the grocery store. So at a bare minimum, I start each day by cooking breakfast and then I can go out. Usually I, I prefer to just have a coffee out to start the day if I'm on a trip. So I cook breakfast at my place and then find a nice place for a coffee before I am all over the city. But on this trip, I don't know what it was, but I just wasn't feeling that. I think part of it was that I was spending so little money on the travel and accommodations that I kind of was like, whatever, I'm just gonna uh, eat breakfast out. And yeah, so I had, I didn't do any cooking. I like ate most of my meals out or even something else I've started to do sometimes when I'm traveling is order food for delivery, um, which I never used to order delivery stuff in the US because it's just like, it costs an arm and a leg to have Uber Eats bring you something to eat. So I only, like the only times I did it in the US were when I was like super ill and like in a lot of pain and couldn't move. Like when I threw my back out, <laughs> I was ordering food. But yeah, there's something to be said for me, at least for like, just in general with traveling and going on trips, like doing what you want to do and doing it your way and not feeling pressured. That's the great thing about a solo trip is that I got to do whatever I want and like go wherever I want. But it's just something about like ugh, going to restaurants and being waited on and the whole experience can be really nice. But if I'm doing it too much, like it gives me some type of dread or anxiety where I just don't want to deal with it. Like I don't want to be waited on. I don't want to have to deal with a stranger who is like being forced to serve me and be polite to me. I don't want to then like have to think about like, what do I need to tip and do, do I have the right cash? Can I tip on the card? What is the tipping custom where I'm at? Um, <laughs> the pacing of the meal. Like sometimes I'm really just in the mood to like eat quickly and be out. And like, that can be really hard at some restaurants. People like to take their time, especially more in Europe, which I love, but I'm not always in the mood for that. So like the past couple of trips I've gone on, I have more than once, uh, like had a full day of doing touristy stuff and then gone to my Airbnb at like, whatever 5 p.m 6 p.m got cozy ordered food in and enjoyed it like even if it's just like subway or something or mcdonald's like not every meal needs to be um super fancy or like i don't need to try every delicacy of local cuisine everywhere i go like <laughs> If you're a hater on this, don't tell me, I don't care. Because people feel strongly about stuff like this and about traveling and like some people are way different travelers and it is important to them that like, some people think it's like total sacrilege and heresy that I would eat McDonald's when I'm in a foreign country, but that's your opinion, okay? Like I had also really delicious Hungarian food, chicken paprikash, um, gosh, this trip was months ago now, so I don't remember the name of the flatbread. I think it starts with an L, but it's like, um, it actually reminded me of Native American fry bread. So similar there. So like a flatbread 
fried in oil, I think is how they make it. And uh, with toppings, so kind of like a pizza. I had one with like, they call it farmer sausage and cheese and red onion, it was good. So yeah, if you can, um, do your do what you want to do, do your own thing. Uh, I don't think going on a trip and traveling should make you feel stressed and pressured. Like you're spending your money to go do what you want. Like, what do you? If it's just like an external pressure of like what you're expected to do and what you should be expected to experience, then reevaluate that. And that's normal too. Like, I think there's always a little bit of stress of like, oh my gosh, I need to like see the best things and pick the best places. Uh, but that too, I kind of like, I had a lot of work to get done that week, uh, knitting wise and design wise. So every day I was trying to find some cafe that was cozy and preferably beautiful to relax in or some type of space that was beautiful that I would be allowed to sit in for a few hours and knit. So it, it made for like a really interesting pacing to this trip that I loved where, you know, I would wake up different times, different days, but generally breakfast, uh, breakfast out with a coffee, go do one to two touristy things, maybe have lunch between them or after them. And then for the afternoon, settle somewhere for hours, uh, knitting and then uh, most nights I like went home and either picked up food on the way home or ordered in only one or two nights that I do a proper dinner out. And I really loved that pace of like only doing one to two like big touristy things like a guided tour or going into a museum or I was, I bought a transit pass for the city and then I ended up walking almost everywhere even if it was like a 45 minute walk or an hour walk I just didn't feel like I was in a hurry and I also didn't do tons and tons of research for this trip so I was like what better way to like find cool stuff and shops to go into than by walking everywhere and I was glad I did that though uh I was wearing shoes Nike Dunks that were too small for my feet I realized they're comfortable to wear here and there but on a trip where my feet are like getting swollen by the end of the day, my feet were blistering and like bleeding. So after like two days, I had to go to the mall and go to Skechers and buy what are called go walk sixes <laughs> and they're slip-ons and honestly, they're pretty ugly. But my trip has been over for two months and I'm still wearing my Skechers almost every day. They're my new favorite pair of shoes. I love that they're slip-ons and they're so comfortable. I'm sorry, they're ugly. Ugh. Okay, um, just to highlight a few of my favorite things I did in Budapest, I went, did I go two or three times to the baths? Um, and which baths did I go to? Gellert? No, it wasn't Gellert. And it wasn't the famous ones that start with S. I don't know how to pronounce it. Hungarian spelling is, uh, very intense looking um, and the language to me sounded like I, I couldn't tell what I was listening to um, which is interesting like a lot of languages <clears throat> I can hear and sort of guess a language family. Hungarian sounded totally foreign to my ear and then when I was reading about it it is a really unique language its closest uh, related language is I believe Finnish was what I read so I love the baths. Sorry, I can't remember which ones I went to. Um, I went to the ones that uh, on certain times and certain days separate men and women, or it's like men only on some days and women only on some days because you're bathing in the nude, um, which like if I'm gonna take a bath and a beautiful bath, I don't wanna wear a swimsuit. That's just me. So I went to that one. I think it's the only one in the city like that. So if you want to figure it out, I'm sure you can. I love the baths. I uh, found this great thrift store again. Oh my gosh, I always do this on these videos and people are probably clicking off of this video exponentially. 
because I like, I thought like, oh, I want to talk about this thrift store where I bought these shirts and it didn't occur to me until now that like I should look up the name of that thrift store, but <laughs> sorry, I don't know. If you like are planning a trip to Budapest and you desperately want to know the name of this thrift store, please put it in the comments and I can find it and put it in a comment. But I, I wandered into this thrift store just walking past it and I found these two silk shirts for, I think they're about five euros a piece and they're a hundred percent silk. Um, they're super worn and like obviously very pre-loved, very secondhand. Um, but I love the way this fabric looks so worn. Um, I've been trying to figure out as a, a sewist, you know, interested in fabric and textiles, what the substrate of this silk is. And the closest thing I could come up with is crepe de chine. I'm not sure, it's super thin. It's like feather light. It's almost a little bit translucent. Um, and it has a natural like sheen to it, but it's not a satin weave, obviously. You can see it more up close. They're from different brands, but they seem like the same fabric to me. But I really loved wearing them, and I haven't done any sewing since I've been in Croatia, but it's making me excited to sew again when I get home, and I really want to try making my own silk shirts. I've always heard silk is super difficult to work with, but then when I was reading about all the different silk substrates, crepe de chine, um, because it has a little bit of texture and it's slightly more matte, it's actually supposed to be much easier to sew than more like slippery silks. So yeah, I got these silk shirts secondhand. And then I went to um, this library, which I don't know if it was their national library or what. Again, like I can put more info if people are actually wanting to like know exact names of places, um, just let me know that you want to know that. Um, but again, you could probably find it if you search like beautiful library in Budapest, because I think this is probably the most grand, beautiful library in the city. It's um, in this old building where part of it is like a modern library. And then um, one of the middle floors is like preserved uh, of this like palace library that is just like beautifully gilded and gold and totally baroque and fancy and it's got a bunch of rooms with tables for reading and studying and then like armchairs and and like more cozy comfy seating so i saw that recommended online somewhere and i was like oh my gosh that's perfect um as like a tourist visiting the city i did have to like just buy a little ticket to enter um that library but it was a uh, pretty inexpensive, like maybe four or five euros. And there was no time limit. So I found a nice table and I sat and I read my book on my iPad and knitted for a few hours until I got hungry for dinner and then I left. But I loved that library. Uh, I really thought about coming back. Did I go twice? I don't remember. I went to the Hungarian parliament building, which like the, the fact that it's just like an old government building, like at my core, I read that and I'm like, oh, I don't really want to see that. Like, I don't, I don't need to see a parliament building, but it was so highly recommended um, that I was like, okay, I better see it. And it was kind of expensive too, if I remember correctly, like probably more than 20 euros for the ticket. And uh, you have to book in advance, they sell out and the, uh, it's a guided tour at like an exact time slot that you purchase. And I loved it. Like visually, I think that was some of the most striking stuff that I saw in Budapest. Um, and I saw, I went to a lot of beautiful places. Um, highly recommend the parliament tour. I left my, there's like, it's high security cause it's still functioning government building. So there's like x-ray machines and a coat check. And I accidentally left my phone in my coat. So 
and, and like they were pretty serious about like once the tour started like there was someone in the front of our group and in the back of the group like they're making sure we're not like wandering around so i really didn't want to uh inconvenience anyone by being like hold on let me go get my phone so i just like didn't have my phone but in a way that made me feel better than everyone <laughs> like i don't need to be taking pictures of everything i'm in the moment i'm present i'm making memories uh but no the most stunning room of the hungarian parliament building was no photos allowed that's where they like house the crown jewels and it was just this like really grand stunning huge dome ceiling room and that was the room that i was like most moved by and would have wanted to take photos and since it was no photos allowed anyway i really didn't feel like i missed out not having my phone for like an hour long tour or maybe even 45 minute tour it wasn't super long but i recommend that i also decided to go see an opera uh budapest has a beautiful opera house and i saw rusalka by dvorak i want to say that that is dvorak's only opera and it is in czech language um which is cool not a lot, you know, most composers, regardless of their mother tongue, were writing operas. I mean, it depended on what musical era we're talking about, but usually in Italian, German. So a Czech opera is cool. And the opera house was stunningly beautiful. I had good seats near the front on the ground. And I used to as like a trained violinist and pianist with a master's degree in violin performance like i have played a lot of operas i have seen a lot of operas i think when i was a much younger adult i uh like to try to like kid myself and fool myself into being like i love opera opera is the best like art form and as i've gotten older i'm just better at being honest with myself and others and like i am not that into opera it's not my favorite genre there are some operas that i love but in general it most operas are like long um the narrative pacing of opera tends to be very slow like uh many arias will have a line of text repeated many times before the singer is singing a new line of text so yeah it's just a little bit boring sorry but i was like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna be cultured I'm on a trip um here i am saying like do whatever you want on a trip and don't feel pressured and then i'm like well i felt pressured to go see an opera and pretend i like opera but to be fair i have always wanted to see rusalka uh it has a very famous beautiful aria called song to the moon and song to the moon was in the first like i want to say in the first 30 to 40 minutes of the opera and this opera had three acts and two intermissions i think it was two intermissions maybe even three. Oh my gosh no i think it was just two and i was at the opera house for over three hours altogether uh maybe even closer to four with the fact that i like got there half an hour before the performance right so that was a long thing to sit through and then when the most famous song happens in the first act early on then you're like okay <laughs> whatever um it's the story of the little mermaid maybe it's like the more true like original version of the fairy tale i don't know it, it does not have a have a happy ending and the ending was kind of a letdown for me just talking about like not musically just talking about the story i love a sad ending I, I i love a tragic ending but it needs to have a lot more like drama suspense like irony those types of like heavy feelings and vibes I think for it to be effective and this doesn't this kind of is just like and everybody's dead Every, nobody gets to be happy sorry everybody's cursed sorry that's the ending spoiler alert so i didn't love that and i probably would not go out of my way to see rusalka again the set and costuming were more uh like modern and minimalist which 
I wasn't really into for that for that opera uh, since it's like under the sea and there's like a lot of magic elements I would have preferred like high fantasy honestly and I would have enjoyed it more if there was more visually colorful or interesting things and effects to look at in that way but uh, I'm glad I went it was a nice experience overall and now I can say I've seen Rusalka. Uh, okay, let me get into knitting if anyone's still watching. I am wearing my Penta Pillar pullover. I love to name patterns things that are like a tongue twister mouthful. I really love alliteration, so whenever I can, I always do the same letter for every word in the name. Um, so this is Penta Pillar Pullover. Penta for five, because there's one, two, three, four, five pillars on each body panel. And I've been working on this for a while. This was my first time trying an open test, which was really fun. Like, I had a lot of people sign up, um, which I was glad about. Like, maybe over 200? I don't remember. And probably, like, a bit over like 40 maybe close to 50 actually finished uh, which is great and I had a lot of useful feedback and I think people who didn't finish or didn't even do it were happy just to like get a chance to see one of my patterns and see if it's for them and that was kind of the point and I encourage people like even if you think you probably won't knit this like feel free take advantage sign up for this open test to get this pattern um, see if it's to your liking try the technique that was the reason i chose this to be the open test because i want more people trying this modular technique that i use for all my modular patterns uh, i think it seems mysterious and then when you try it it's uh, really fun and like easy i do often get feedback from people that's like i didn't they like can't conceptualize or understand how the modular part is going to work or how it's going to happen so they're picking up stitches all along the edge of like the first pillar that they knit and then they don't understand like okay they're picking up all of these stitches and then they're supposed to be knitting this way and they don't get it but then everyone's like i just followed what you wrote in the pattern and it worked and then i realized what was going on and how it was working and i love to hear that um it like i think some people were like I would like a video of this and I've actually recorded tutorials for this and I'm never happy with them like something about this technique I found difficult to like capture in a concise clear way on a video um and in general like I think everyone who's tried these patterns has been able to learn the technique from trusting the text they just need to get to the point where they actually are like okay let me just try what the designer has written verbatim and see what happens and it, it works uh, at some point I should do a video though one day but yeah I did two samples for this because due to the like simple nature of this pattern it gave me this opportunity to play with changing colors and make this checkerboard so the first one that I knit which I've shown before is this one this is out of Noro Silk Garden Sock. I love Noro. I love Silk Garden Sock. I, uh, it's like kind of a sport weight yarn, but I knitted it almost a worsted gauge because Noro is just so sticky. Um, and I mean, it's not like overly drapey or see-through or something. So I love this colorway. I feel like they discontinued continued it already uh, and it wasn't out for very long. I feel like this colorway was out for like less than a year before they stopped making it but they're always adding new colors of, of silk garden and silk garden sock and taking away old ones so you just got to keep an eye i love to go like at least twice a month i go to the knitting fever international website to see all the noro bases and see if there's any new one usually they're putting out new bases every season and also getting rid of certain ones um, and see what new colors they're putting out in their like mainstay yarns like silk garden sock i don't think is going anywhere they've been making it for so many years whereas sometimes their other bases may only get produced for like a year before they're gone um my first modular pattern i ever did was mystic square and i did that in uh, curio patora 
and I loved that yarn. I was really sad that it got discontinued. It was 100% wool and really soft, actually, for a Noro yarn. Um, Silk Garden, I would say, is decently soft. It does have a silk feel to it, but it, it is still, like, in the world of yarn, it's on the rougher side. In the world of Noro, it's medium to soft because this one that I'm wearing, the Noro is the brown, called brown gray color changing yarn. And that's out of one of their new bases. I had never tried it. I ordered it just to make this. This base is called Tasogare. Um, and it is a similar composition to the Silk Garden. It's like wool, silk, and maybe something else. There might be a little bit of mohair or uh, maybe a little bit of synthetic, I don't remember. And it's quite rough. It is really rustic compared to the Silk Garden Sock. It doesn't bother me to have it on my skin. I bet if I, I bet if it were hot out, it would bother me. That's when I start to get more sensory issues if a yarn is not uh, very soft. Uh, as soon as I start getting sweaty or hot, then I'm like, ooh, it's like making me itch. Uh, but in these early days of spring, it's still quite cold out many days uh, or like not really going still in the 60s on a warm day. Um, this is pretty comfortable. But like Noro is always known for like having knots and having twigs and that too, it just depends on the base. Some like never have knots or like rarely do and uh, others have multiple knots in a skein. I want to say that this Tasogare maybe had like one knot in the skein. And I also, I don't feel like there was a color break. That's the other thing. Sometimes when there's a knot in the skein, it'll just go to a completely different color, um, which people get annoyed by that. And it's understandable, especially this is luxury yarn. It's not cheap. Um, so if you like are determined to have the consistent color gradation, then at that point you need to start ripping through a skein until you get to the color you want again which nobody wants to do that. But this, if I remember correctly, had minimal knots. And it, if there were knots, which I feel like there was probably one knot in at least one of the balls, their big balls are like 200 gram, either 150 or 200 gram balls. So I only went through like one and a half of them. And I feel like the one that I completed probably had a knot in it, but I don't think it was a color change. But anyway, I can't remember well enough to say for sure. I, I wouldn't use Tasogari again, I don't think. I will say it's much thicker than the other one, and I still was able to get gauged just fine. Uh, this is more of like a true worsted, whereas that is like a sport, though this pattern is closer to a uh, like DK worsted type of gauge. And uh, I will say that this Tasogari yarn had a ton of VM vegetal matter as we call it people use that term more like in the spinning world uh, but basically little pieces of twigs and grass which is something else that i was saying noro is kind of known for silk garden almost never has any like twigs in it for me very little uh but this had a lot and they were kind of sharp and they're like spun into the yarn so like you'd have to be careful removing them because this yarn is fragile you could break your yarn I didn't because I'm always careful, but if you weren't, you could. But I I love the color. I'm really like into brown and black and earth tones these days, it seems. So I actually think I'm gonna get a lot of wear out of this. And if you're subscribed to my newsletter, I wrote about this a little bit in the newsletter I sent off a couple days ago, but I was wearing this out for the first time since completing it. And it just like really hit me. It's a feeling that I used to feel all the time as like a beginner maker. And now I started sort of taking, making my own clothes for granted. But I, I just got hit with this feeling of like, wow, like I am clothing myself with something that I made with my own two hands, like that took me hours and hours of work and like money invested in it and years of like learning and skill to be able to not just make, but design something original like this. And the result is something that is like functional and beautiful and totally unique. Like nobody can buy this. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and it's just nice to like feel that sense of like 
accomplishment and also gratitude to have the like resources and time and and like know-how to make clothes um yeah just a cool feeling i don't know if y'all can relate some of you who have also been making your own clothes for years and years that it's you just you have so much now that you've made that like it doesn't feel as special but if you think about it it really is so enjoy that and chase that feeling a little bit um so yeah the instructions for this checkerboard are like part of the pattern i also in the testing phase i had not yet decided that i wanted to include like a checkerboard sleeve version but as I was ending this, I was like, yeah, I definitely want to do that. So I did it on this sample and then I added that into the instructions before the pattern was published. So um, yeah, some testers like did their own checkerboard sleeve versions. And that's the thing, like, especially once the, so the way I did it, I knit these sleeves flat separately and seamed them on um, rather than making them also be like joined as you go in a modular way, just because um, that's what made the most sense for me. Uh, and that was like the most intuitive, but like once you work your way through this pattern, you could probably think of like three or four different ways to make and attach uh, a checkerboard sleeve. But I've included in the pattern the way I've done it, which I think is pretty simple. And there, I, I could make like a dozen of these if I had the time. There's just so many fun, cool things you could do with color and texture. I mean, I used Rowan Kinsel K's mohair for my other color, so I have this huge textural play going on, um, and half of this sweater is kind of see-through, which I think is really cool. And for a long time, I've like loved, I've always loved checkerboard pattern, and for a long time I've been thinking of like what would be the best way to do a checkerboard where I don't have to do any intarsia or um, stranded knitting either, uh, especially with a larger checkerboard like this, you don't want to be floating, you know, like 20, 30 stitches. And this was the solution. So I hope anyone who would like a checkerboard garment considers this, uh, for the ease of the construction. So I also came out with my super bulky drop sleeve sweater, which I've shown on here before, so I will get through it quickly. But I just wanna show it again. I've been, I generally like don't wear any of my knits before they've been photographed for a pattern release because the more you wear them, the more the wear will show, right? These are delicate items, but I couldn't help myself. As soon as I finished this, I started wearing it many times per week, honestly. It's actually starting to kind of get too warm to wear this anymore for the season. But uh, I knit this out of Adria Phil Hypnotico. Um, the details are on the Ravelry page for this pattern. And uh, it's part of my big book of, <laughs> big book of basic bulk, big book of basic drop sleeve sweaters, I think is what it's called. Oh my gosh. I don't know the names of anything, not even my own books and designs. But there's two patterns in it now. Every time I'm adding a pattern, the price will go up a little bit. So if you want to eventually have a collection of drop sleeve sweaters all at different gauges, consider buying into it now, $16 right now. I'm still undecided if I want it to have four or five patterns. I like have decided to make each one be like at an even number, uh, like an exact number of stitches per inch. So this is two stitches per inch and this is super bulky. The previous one that came out was bulk, just bulky and it's three stitches per inch. My next one will be worsted, um, and that'll be four stitches per inch. And all of these kind of, with any of my designs, like they work with a range of yarn weights. So um, I think a, like a kind of a really lighter, chunky or bulky yarn might be a little too light for my three stitch per inch one. So like that one is like bulky slash super bulky. And this one is like super bulky almost slash jumbo but if we really i was like reading about like yarn classification jumbo was just getting more into territory of like one stitch per inch almost but i think there are some yarns that are kind of between that would work 
Uh, so my next one will be four stitches per inch, and it'll be the worsted basic bulky, ugh, basic bulky, worsted basic drop sleeve sweater, I think will be the name. <laughs> but really you could think of it as like worsted slash Aran. And then after that, I'll do five stitches per inch. And that would probably be more like DK slash worsted. And if I decide to do a fifth one, it'll be six stitches per inch. And that would probably be like fingering slash sport, I would think. I'd have to swatch and choose yarns. I don't think I'd want to go beyond six stitches per inch. And obviously I could also have gauges that are between, but I just like this idea of like a certain number of stitches per one inch. You can kind of, if you have a few of those, you can make almost any yarn work in one of those gauges, right? So yeah, definitely not planning on going to seven stitches per inch, but definitely four and five, and then I'm considering six. Uh, love this sweater. Ex I'm excited to do the worsted one. That's my favorite gauge. 16 stitches per four inches or four stitches per inch. I love that gauge. It's like not too heavy on the hands, but it still goes so quickly. Also, all of these patterns are written to where the body Ooh, I just lost the sunlight. I bet everything just got really cool toned in here. That was sudden. Um, they're all written where the body could be knit flat or in the round. If you watch my videos, I'm sure you you know this and you've heard this, but it's just because I like to use color changing yarns. And if it's color changing yarn, then I'm gonna knit it flat because that's gonna get an even uh, and wider distribution of colors that doesn't change from knitting part in the round and part flat. Actually, it would be flat and in the round. So yeah, and I am thinking of using Noro, maybe Noro Ito, which I've never used, but I've always thought is super beautiful for my worsted one. Um, we'll see. Also, I might knit that for my mom. My mom saw my, my bulky basic drop sleeve, which is like self-striping, like bright pink, red, blue. It's super colorful. And uh, she, kept, she kept saying like, okay, well, if you don't want it, you can give it to me. <laughs> so I got to knit her something. As long as she'll model. That's the thing. Like the only way I'm, I'm knitting someone a garment is if they're agreeing to model it for me. Because like I only have time to be knitting designs, unfortunately, for the most part. That's that. Um, as soon as I finished that, I like currently don't have anything to knit, so I grabbed my rib lace raglan that I I haven't worked on this since like August. Uh, I was on the coast the last time I was working on this, and I actually haven't knit it <laughs> since picking it back up, but I did block it because I just wanted to see how it would block out, try it on, and decide how much more I need to knit the body. The body could be good now, but lately I have been like when I was a few years ago with my style and my aesthetic, I was knitting everything super cropped and now I'm liking like full length stuff a lot more. So just to be on the safe side that I'm gonna enjoy wearing this and like like the way it sits, um, I will probably knit two inches more on the body. And then for the sleeves, I think three inches more is gonna be good. It'll still be on the short side, but like so many people love to on their raglans, uh, especially on raglans, just bind off like the stitches at the bottom of the sleeve at the end of the yoke for the raglan or knit like two rows, um, which I understand the appeal of that, but I generally think it looks a little bit nicer just to even have one inch of knitting. Uh, it just looks a little bit more complete that way. But for me, it's not just about it looking complete. I actually just want a little bit of a longer sleeve. Um, that's this. We'll see if I actually end up knitting on this because once I have a second to sit down and work, I do know what I'm designing next. I just need to do the math, the grading, the writing, and then I can start knitting. And like, I've been working a lot the past few months to have so many things like ready to go. And it's been nice. It's been like a lot of work, but it's been, it's always my idea that I 
never like run out of things to knit. So while I'm knitting one design that's already been written, um, you know, I should have something else that I've already knitted and written that's in testing. One thing that I've written and I'm knitting my initial sample before the test. And then hopefully I'm working on something else on the math and the writing so that I'll have something to knit once I finish whatever else I'm knitting. So it's like you kind of have at least three things going on at a time, which for the past several months, I have had a, a minimum of three, if not like four or five, because I've started to have a lot of test knits that are even overlapping. That's always how it is. Like this is my busier time of year. And then I sort of fizzle out and slow down in the fall and the winter. And then I like to pick things up for the new year. But uh, as of now, I have nothing new that I'm knitting and I have one pattern still in testing and ready to go for next month. It'll be for my birthday release. And that is my, uh, and that yarn, by the way, was BC Garn Soft Silk. So I have my newest mesh design ready to go. This is called the Partition Pullover because to me it kind of looked like a fancy screen partition that maybe has some beautiful woodworking or delicate ornate screen element to it and it's kind of I think of it as like a partition just not totally covering your body but obscuring your body so um here it is keep keep these sleeves away from my lit candle and it is knit top down it's drop sleeve I've kind of left these sleeves a little bit big at the ends um, it's got twisted rib for the collar and the hem and then I just did a loose I-cord bind off for the cuffs and I love it it's really elegant I will say I, I, I mean it's knit top down flat until you get to the armpit and then in the round for the rest of the body and then the sleeves are also in the round and it was just a reminder of like why I like knitting things flat and I like really don't mind seaming. I'm happy I designed this to be in the round because that's what more people want and I don't blame them. Like it's much more appealing to not have to seam. But I definitely, I like knew I should have swatched both in the round and flat and I just like couldn't get myself to do that. I was like, I'm such a good knitter. I don't need to do that. And when I switched from flat to in the round, like something about this lace, like the stitches that were like on the needles, the like more recent rows was just looking looser and like sloppy to me for some reason. Um, I don't know why knitting it in the round made it look that way, but it was looking like loose and sloppy. So I was like, oh, I need to tighten up. So I started knitting so much tighter for the rest of the body. You can probably even like, tell or see a little bit just holding it up but it definitely gets visibly tighter after the underarm and it fits me like closer to the body and I'm so annoyed um because it's not exactly the fit I wanted I wanted more positive ease if I had time I would knit another one but I don't really have time the pattern is good the numbers are good it was just my gauge that went off and then in the sleeves, I, I realized at that point that I had let my body gauge get so tight that in the sleeves I knit so loose and I, I think my gauge ended up being spot on for the sleeves. And the stitches don't actually look like sloppy or loose. It was just something about the way they looked when they were fresh on the needles. Once it's like dropped down a few rows, everything settles and looks normal to me. Um, so if I had just kept my tension loose on the body, my gauge probably would have stayed the same. Of course, if I'm gonna suddenly start knitting much tighter, it's gonna get tighter. But I don't know, in the moment, I was like, I need to do that. So yeah, I mean, I still think it looks really cool and I still am gonna wear it. I just wish that the body was, it's not tight on me, it's just more fitted than I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be, like most of my mesh stuff is on the more fitted side and this is 
my, my most relaxed mesh knit to date. Um, yeah. So anyway, look forward to that for my birthday release. There are a few straggler ends that need to get tucked in on this. There's one on the shoulder. And next I want to go ahead and do the partition tank top. I love this stitch. I think it's so elegant and beautiful. So I want, and I have more of this yarn. This yarn is um, Cumbria from Pasquale Yarns, which they are new to me. And they were, they sponsored one of the classes I taught at Barcelona Knits Festival in November. And when they sponsored that class, they reached out to me and let me know that if I ever wanted to work with their yarns to let them know. And um, they gave all the students in the class a skein of this Cumbria. And so I got to see it and I was like, actually, that Cumbria that I got back in November was sort of perfect for this type of mesh design. It's like a, I don't remember the exact composition, but it's something like a 50-50 cotton viscose, I think, or cotton rayon. And uh, that's a really good composition for a summer knit and a lace knit. Like it's really drapey uh, and heavy and like sits the way I want it to sit. So, I have more of this and I'm just going to do the tank top in the same yarn and the same color. Maybe it's boring for people, but it's, it's something I'll get a lot of wear out. Like a black mesh tank top is sexy and elegant. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know how long it's going to take me to get that pattern ready and in testing. I would love to have that tank top, tank top come out in May, but we'll see. It might be June. Um, so what else did I want to talk about? I've been in my jewelry class, which I mentioned, I think, in the last video that I was, uh, potentially going to be taking a jewelry class, but it, it started and it was 10 meetings, which I just had my 10th meeting. I need one more actually to finish the project I'm on but it has been really fun. Uh, it was super worth it. Oh my gosh, the cat is meowing to interrupt. She meows so nasty and so not delicate. I also lost my cat, Virginia, which if you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw. Uh, my brother has been taking care of her for me while I've been gone and she just got sick and like her health declined so rapidly and they ended up um, having to put her down, which was really sad, but, um, I got a lot of sweet messages on Instagram, so thank you for that. <laughs> oh my god, am I gonna make myself cry about my cat? <laughs> I thought I wasn't sad about it anymore. Um, she had a delicate, beautiful meow. <laughs> Unlike this cat who meows in the most obnoxious and disgusting way ever, Virginia had a beautiful, soft, feminine, cute, sweet, high-pitched meow. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, anyway, rest in power, little baby. But why did I bring that up during my jewelry class talk? I don't know. Oh, because the cat was interrupting me. Um, I've loved learning metalworking, silversmithing. It's something I've wanted to do for a couple of years. It's been on my mind and I found this class. Um, it was definitely like worth the tuition I paid for it. it. It was like a 600 euro class, just to tell you, like, I don't know, I see no reason to keep that private. <laughs> um, for 10, 10 two hour classes and it's only one, they take one student at a time. So it's the master jeweler and then his, um, he has kind of like, I don't want to call her an assistant. She's more of a collaborator, but she does also like learn from him. Um, so it's two highly skilled and like experienced jewelers and one student. So I'm getting two teachers giving me like their undivided attention for two hours and for 10 meetings, I'm really happy with the like investment in this course and in this skill and i walked away with a lot of pieces of jewelry so let me just show some of the stuff i've made 
um, I'm wearing the first ring that I made, which is just a basic, simple silver ring. And then I went on to a silver ring with a gemstone setting. This is just like a quartz cabochon, right? And if you're not like familiar with jewelry terms, a cabochon is just a smooth polished gemstone that doesn't have flat sides, it's round. Um, it's not faceted. So like this ring, which I did not make, I bought this. This ring also has a aquamarine cabochon. Um, and then this more like contemporary style pearl ring. I bet it'll focus better. Like I always do this as a joke, but it's actually helpful if, it, if the camera can't see my face anymore. So I don't know if I did that properly for this ring. Let me show it again. And then we also did a, a brooch um, with engraving. We did a we added a patina, which made it like dark, like bluey black colored, and then we engraved on top of the patina. Um, so it's been really fun, super cool. It's totally demystified jewelry to me. Like I just went to a craft market. Uh, two days ago and there were a lot of jewelers there actually mostly like people who work with silver um, some people who work with like brass and copper as well and I, I really viewed their their pieces with different eyes because uh, I'm like looking at it and thinking how was this made and like oh I could make this or oh I understand how this might have been made so it's really cool to be able to look at jewelry with knowledge now I did end up buying a ring from a craftsman at the craft fair. This just a sil uh, simple silver. This this ring with the two beads of silver. I, I like the the shape of those beads. It's very organic looking. Um, and that jeweler was super nice. Also, I talked to two of the jewelers there and told them like I was learning silversmithing, and they both asked where I was learning. And when I told them. The name of my like master and his jewelry shop like his, I was really happy to hear that his reputation like really precedes him because they were both like oh he's he has a huge reputation as like a master jeweler and um as a great teacher like not just in Zagreb but like in Croatia and throughout maybe throughout Europe even um but yeah love to hear that <laughs> And I'm just now working on my final piece, which they kind of let you choose something you want to, to do if, if you want to, to like do something of your own. And I'm just doing something similar to the, the gemstone setting I showed you, um, but with my own gemstones that I got at a gem and mineral show a few months back. I have these two tanzanite cabochons, which that's like a bluey purple stone that I really like. And hopefully on Tuesday, we'll be able to finish. I'm doing two matching rings, one for me and one for my friend Anna. Uh, but I'll move soon and I'm hoping very soon after I get settled, I can think about investing in the tools, equipment and necessary space for making jewelry, like potentially as a little side hustle. So if you have any interest in in the future, potentially owning a piece of James and Watts jewelry, that is something that could be on the horizon. Um, I, I hope it is. I've really enjoyed having a new like creative medium to work in. And now that I have some basic skills, I have a lot of ideas for things I want to try. Um, I've been feeling really inspired lately with fashion and design um in a way that in a different direction than i normally am i i've been reading wheel of time as you know i'm on book nine i i did book eight on audiobook and i i listen it was a shorter one but i listened to it in like less than a week that whole book was super like fast paced and interesting um some of the books have a lot of like boring downtime but book eight was really good and then I don't have another Audible credit, so I'm reading just the regular book for book nine. Um, but like, I've been really inspired by the world of Wheel of Time. I got into it from the TV show, which by the way, I had a DM on Instagram from someone who watches this podcast and they were like, we need to talk Wheel of Time. I just finished the book series a few months ago and I was like, oh my gosh, 
like I'm loving it. And then they responded and were like, actually I work as part of the crew for the TV show. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe that like this, it was a knitter messaging me, it just happens to work on the production of Wheel of Time. It was so cool. And they gave me a little bit of insight into some of the happenings on set and I was eating it up. I, I would love to know everything on the behind the scenes of that show. But yeah, between the show and the book, like I love the aesthetics of like high fantasy and like that's been inspiring me. And then I saw Dune, which like I've really not been into movies the past years. Like I never go to the movie theater or like seldom go to the movie theater. And I usually don't watch movies at home. I just like can never get myself to commit to something that's two hours. I like don't want to, I don't want to choose and I don't want to sit for that long. Um, but then I'll watch Real Housewives for like four or five hours straight while I knit. But it's just different. It's totally different. You don't have to be so invested to have reality TV on. But Anna really wanted to see Dune 2. And I was like, okay, I'll go see Dune 2 with you, but we need to watch Dune 1 because I haven't seen it. So we watched Dune 1 just at the house and I loved it. I thought it was so fun and so cool. And then the next day we saw Dune 2 in the movie theater and I really enjoyed that. It was really fun to see them back to back, but the aesthetics and the costuming of those movies are out of this world. If you like looking at like high fantasy sci-fi, like type of high fashion costumes, like the way that the Reverend Mothers and the Bene Gesserit women are dressed is just like sickening. I love it. I can't stop thinking about it. And then I also started playing Elden Ring on PS5, which like that was the number one game I wanted to play when I was hoping to buy a PS5. Like I wanted to get a PS5 for a couple of years before I actually got one. And then when I got one, that was the first game I downloaded and then I didn't play it. I just like got scared because that game has a reputation as being so difficult and big. So I like never played it. And then one of my friends was messaging me like, you have to play Elden Ring. He also reads Wheel of Time. And he's like, it's like got the high fantasy of like Wheel of Time in, in a video game and it's super fun and the lore is so cool. And so he got me into it and I've become like addicted to this game the past week. And um, the aesthetics of that world are also inspiring me. So like I keep thinking about like these more experimental, conceptual, high fantasy inspired knitwear pieces that I could potentially design and make. And the more, the longer I think about it, the more likely it is that I'm gonna have to do it, to like get it out of my system. I just, I don't know that it's something I would actually find any cause to wear. Maybe when I'm back in the States and like, I don't know, more, there's like more queer spaces available to me and maybe I would wear some more wacky stuff. But I also don't know how marketable it is and how many knitters wanna wear like, fantasy gear <laughs> but uh even if it's just something beautiful to look at on instagram there's something to be said for creating something that's visually stunning even if people don't want to buy the pattern or knit one themselves but i have a few ideas floating around and if you're in the market for high fantasy knits please encourage me because then maybe i'll actually do it uh so yeah feeling inspired uh, wanting to start <laughs> needing more costumes for live action role play of Wheel of Time, Elden Ring, and Dune. Um, I've been going to the gym. I mean, I'm always going to the gym, but like my frequency and my approach is always evolving and changing. And I would say for like the past year, almost, I've had very little progress at the gym. Like I'm not really getting stronger. Uh, my weight has been super stable, but before a year ago, I was like both steadily losing weight and getting much stronger, which is called recomposition, right? Um, and it's kind of normal that that's gonna end at some point, but I didn't know what to do at the gym. Like, I'm not sure also how to eat and how to work out to get some type of progress in like my strength and whatever. And, um, 
I decided to reach out to my uncle, which like I'm part of a family where my nuclear family, is that is that like the immediate family unit? Like mom, dad, and kids, right? Is that nuclear family? My nuclear family is uh, really close. Um, I don't go home a lot. I don't see them a lot, but like we're close, we all get along. Um, and in my extended family, not so much. I mean, now we kind of have new extended family because I have nieces and nephews. My parents are grandparents many times over. And so now that part of the extended family is pretty close with like most, most of my siblings still live um, in the Houston area. So we all, ex they all see each other. Um, I don't know if you can hear the cat, but she's wailing in the background again. So, uh, my extended family, uh, on like my parents' generation though, like I was not close with any of my grandparents, nor was I close with any, um, aunts and uncles. Um, but my ma maternal uncle, I met him once as a kid and I honestly didn't like him. <laughs> Uh, but whatever. He and I have never had any relationship, but he's been going to the gym since he was 14. Uh, he's like super into fitness. He started gyms and like workout programs. He's like a proper gym dude. He's in his 60s now and still works out every day. And my brother actually, I was talking to him about like feeling stuck with my fitness. And he was like, you should reach out to our uncle. And so I was like, okay, actually that's not a bad idea. Like it took me a few months to like work up the nerve to like be like, hello, my uncle who I've met once and spoken to once. Um, but my mom was like, oh my God, you should reach out to my brother. He would love to hear from you and love to help you. And he did, like I reached out to him. We ended up FaceTiming for like over an hour and he listened to like all of my progress and all of my, my personal thoughts. And I'm not very educated on fitness stuff um and then he gave me all his recommendations and he gave me a whole new workout plan to follow so I've been following that and it's given me a whole lot of like zest for working out again that I was starting to lose like I'm, I've started to feel excited to go to the gym again just because it's so nice to be trying something new and so far I actually feel like I'm starting to see results again the main thing with how I was eating was he just told me which I kind of knew this but it took having someone more experienced telling me to actually make a change, I just needed to eat a lot more protein. Which like going out of my way to like, in general, I don't track my food. I'm not counting anything. I'm not counting calories, I'm not counting carbs. Because of my diabetes, I am aware of nutritional content in food and I know what I can and can't eat or I know what I can't eat a lot of, right? So in general, I'm just not eating anything with sugar in it or like with a lot of sugar. It's very rare. like. I'm not gonna have a big piece of cake. It'll just make my blood sugar skyrocket, right? So like, I just have some general guidelines that I practice in my life with the way I eat to manage my diabetes and I don't have to think about it and I'm not tracking anything. The only thing I track is my blood sugar. I check my blood sugar in the morning fasting just to make sure it's normal. Um, or if I do eat a little bit of something that's an aberration to see did it affect my blood sugar or not. In the, in the like long run of the next day. But yeah, it goes against my nature to track anything, but I did decide, I'm not really even tracking it, but I am just getting much more protein. And I think it's immediately making a difference in my ability to see progress with strength again, which has been really gratifying. Plus, I actually like the protein stuff I've been getting. Every day when I go to the gym, I stop into the convenience store nearby and get a protein shake and like a little, uh, a little protein, either cookie or brownie. They have some that are like artificially sweetened. So probably those chemicals are killing me in other ways, but my blood sugar is staying where it needs to be. So yeah, gym is going well. For anyone who has interest in like strength training, the main difference of what he's having me do is like slow motion strength training. So uh, it's about having increased time under tension to build muscle. So rather than doing like quick pumps on like a chest press or something, I'm like 
counting one, two, three, four, and then back five, six, seven, eight, which that's so tiring in a completely different way. And it, like I had to go down on all of my weights when I first started doing this because like some heavy weights that I could lift relied on like explosive motion and energy and to be able to move slowly takes strength in a different way. But every week the weights are going up pretty quickly. So that's how things are going at the gym. And um, I'll be moving soon. My digital nomad permit runs out in May. I've been here close to two years. It would be two years in August. And I've been really grateful for the ability to come here, reconnect with my friend. Um, feels totally random in a way, ending up in Croatia for almost two years. But it's time to go back and I'm ready. I'm excited to be back in the United States. My plan is to move to Chicago, but of course it's stressful. Moving is one of the most stressful things we can go through. It's not fun. <laughs> and I, I have no idea what the logistics are gonna look like. I have my family in Houston, a storage locker filled with furniture in Tallahassee, and I would like to shop for apartments in Chicago. And it's a horrible market for housing right now. So if there are any like rich patrons who love me and love my work and want to support me, um, and you just like have a giant apartment in Chicago that sits empty and you want to rent it to me for really cheap or for free, then just let me know because we could work that out, okay? Uh, I wish. Whatever happened to patrons of the arts in that way? Like I feel like you used to hear about like painters who just had some like rich person who loved them and just paid for everything in their lives so that they could paint. I need that. I need that so that I can design wacky stuff that I don't have to worry about profitability. Like, please let me design full like mesh bodysuits that cover from head to toe. Like, I want something creepy like that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's a horrible market. I remember before I decided to go to Croatia, I was thinking about moving to Chicago and I was able to find a lot of apartments even close to $800 a month. And now almost nothing is $800 a month. And if you do find something that, that's that cheap, it's uh, too small for me to be able to live comfortably, especially as, I mean, I work from home. So any amount of extra space I can have is appreciated and is used. I spend the majority of my time in my home. And especially now as I want to look into starting jewelry from my home, you need a whole like dedicated space and a lot of equipment for that. So it, it it's, might be difficult to find what I need in the city. But I do feel like a sense of like determination to like make it work. One thing I'm really excited about for moving back is getting back into the music scene. I love playing violin in an orchestra and I'm sure after a few months in Chicago, I should be able to find some semi-professional types of orchestras that I can get paid to play in. Um, I'm not going to be like auditioning for Chicago Symphony. Like that's not really my thing. I'm not there, nor will I ever be. Uh, but like we call them like regional orchestras, smaller semi-professional orchestras, not even semi-professional orchestras, but just not, it's not a full-time job, right? They might have between six to 10 concerts a year or something, where Chicago Symphony is having a concert every week. You know, so it'll be nice. I mean, I'm excited to play, but it'll be nice to get that income again from playing music. Uh, that's about all I have to say for today. And because of my impending move, I don't know that I, it might be months before I record another one of these. Maybe I'll find time to do it in uh, late April or early May, but no promises. So if I don't see you till June or July or August, um, come see me on Instagram, I'm always there, and TikTok. Hopefully I keep posting on TikTok, I think it's fun. All right, uh, thanks for watching. Enjoy, happy knitting, smooches, bye.